Alrighty, good evening everyone and welcome back once again reporting live from Washington DC for another episode of the Neutral Zone Podcast. Alrighty, alrighty. Uh, gentlemen, uh, feel free to introduce yourself. I'll start. I'm Daniel Fernald. I'm a content member for the NCDA as well as the head coach of Maryland. I was a player until last year when I graduated. I'll pass it on to Alec next. Um, I'm Alec Dean, and I'm a player at MSU. I'm uh, Ryan Ginsberg. I'm a captain at Ohio State. I'm Terrence Jackett. I'm a captain at Ohio, uh, OU, Ohio University. All righty, then. And with that being said, uh, gentlemen, as you already know, um, here will be our talking points for tonight. Uh, today, you know, we're going to be talking about the Michigan Dodgeball Cup, the Ohio Dodgeball Cup, War Six, National Contenders, and All American Contenders. Um, give or take, we're going to do about roughly about ten minutes per subject. So it's currently seven oh seven right now. So first topic, obviously, it's going to be. Uh, the Michigan Dodgeball Cup, and we'll go for about seven seventeen. So, whoever want to go first, floor is yours. Um, I'm not sh- uh, really sure how much there's to say. There was, I'm glad how much talent there was at NDC, right? So, last year there wasn't like there wasn't CMU at all. They surprised me. They were better than I expected. Western looks a lot better. Um, than they did last year. GV looked like they were back to their old selves at MDC. So, all in all, I think it was a really good showing from every team. Um, Saginaw looked really good against us and GV, a little bit worse against uh, Western, but I think they were good teams all around. Yeah, both respect to Western. Western isn't the Western we've seen in the last couple of years. They're a real team now, and you can't really just mess around. And uh, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I think Saginaw is taking them a bit lightly, which they uh, kind of found out there. So, I mean, I, th- I think it's definitely good. It's good to have CMU back in the league, once a perennial powerhouse in the NCDA, but uh, gone last year. But it looks like they're back and rebuilding, so it's good to hear. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway or the biggest game of the day outside of the championship match at the end of the day was definitely Western over Saginaw. I think most people expected Saginaw to win by a few points because of they still have Joe Barber. Cole Michelle looks great. But Western really showed that uh, they really exposed the depth of Saginaw, that if you really take them out, if you, you, it's not that hard to take their depth out. And Western has a lot of athletes. They have a lot of throwers. So if they're able to take trades with Saginaw's top guys or pick off their bottom guys, they really showed that it really doesn't take much to beat Saginaw. And it showed what Western's development and a lot due to coach uh, and founder Peter Bro. Yeah, I'm impressed with Western. Um I was also impressed with GV, I would say, in the title game, even though they didn't win. Uh, they looked considerably better than both of their other matchups against MSU before then. So um, I don't think they've played since then, so it'll be good to see what they look like in Tournament 2 with Josh Hill. He was a big addition to have back. So, yeah, a lot of good dodgeball. Yeah, I think uh, Grand Valley really showed that Michigan State may not be – they're still probably the best team in the league – but I really think they really showed there is a way to beat them. I rewatched the first two points today because I know Grand Valley took the first two. And they really showed if you're able to take like Gerling, uh, Butler, and even Alec out, it's they're not they're not unstoppable if you can keep your top throwers in while getting those guys out and you can get ball control against Michigan State. They really showed there is a way to beat them, although not easy, but there is a way. Yeah, they do have good secondary throwers from what I've seen, but, I mean, they're not quite as hard to get out. They might not have the dodgeball sense that, as you said, Barry, Jack, and Alec do. So if you get the top guys out, the I could see the organization kind of broke down a little bit and they're on their heels instead of attacking. Yeah, I would, I would say that that GV team with Josh Schill automatically is a – I know that we're not in contenders yet, but they're one of the – contenders automatically um that team just looked a lot different with josh uh communication was different um they had a plan coming in the game they are the team to be uh feared for sure yeah i think the difference with josh hill is he gives them an elite corner presence that 
Like, Owen's really good, but I think I like Owen in the middle better. He played well in the middle. And also, when you can move Josh to the corner and have Owen in the middle, it really gives him another thrower in the middle. Earlier in the year, I feel like um, Grand Valley really lacked that middle presence as a thrower. Like, they have Tyler Peach there, but he, he's known for his catching ability. He's not known for just gunning people down. So, when you can have Ben Smart in one corner, Josh Hill in another, and Owen Israel's in the middle, there's really not a weak point on that roster anymore where maybe earlier in the year you could attack their middle if they didn't have any throwers there. Yeah, I would also say that the rookies are uh, looking a lot better. We've played them three times this year, and each time the rookies are improving more and more. They're not making um, too many throws. They're looking for catches. They're blocking. Like They're they're doing what a, a rookie should be doing now, which is something big for them. I'm about to say, you guys, both you, um, Ryan, as well as um, – Alex, you know, you, you guys would talk about rookies, and I know it's not part of our subjects, uh, the five subjects that we have, because um, we do have All-American contenders, but we also have rookie contenders as well, and I definitely know that both you guys, you know, feel very strongly about your particular rookie potentially coming home with the Rookie of the Year award, so do either one of you gentlemen want to talk about that real fast? I think we, I think we since we're on the topic of the Michigan Dodgeball Cup, Cup I'll talk about uh, Fido. I, I thought he looked really good. He definitely. Um, I remember one point he caught uh, Ben Smart and Israel. So his his catching ability did really live up to what they were talking about in the Discord, where he's just an elite catcher. And I could I totally see that he's probably the top rookie catcher in the league. Maybe you have a competition with Nick Foss from JMU, who I've seen as another unreal catcher for a rookie. But I thought the catching from Fido was definitely. As intended, he had a decent throw. I was also impressed with uh, Matt Barrowball on Michigan State. I thought that when Grand Valley did get their uh, top out, that he was really able to step up and take some throws for them and really hold his own against the tough Grand Valley opponent. Yeah, Fida was uh, probably the fastest person I've ever seen in the league, as in terms of like pure running ability. Like he's really good at getting those like balls off the start of the run, and he's really good at. Uh, closing the gap on you like if you don't hustle back against him he will get you out on that uh that counter throw and bearable it's a very probably one of the hardest throwing if not the hardest throwing rookie i'd say um he's already got a lead placement with his ball so both both of those guys are excellent players respectable respectable um, we got about roughly about two minutes left on this topic. Um, anybody, um, how how do you feel like everything that the Michigan um, the Michigan State dodgeball team went through um, that very difficult week and was still able to persevere and not only go undefeated but also go back to back champs um, for the first time in their history um, in the Michigan Dodgeball Cup. Alex, you can you can go ahead and take that question if you want. It was just a whole different atmosphere um, that weekend. Like, obviously, we all know what happened there, but like, we didn't have practice. We didn't have anything. We all just kind of um, came together that day and we're like, "Hey, we got we got to win this game for us, for Michigan State, for everything like that." So we just went out and executed, and it was just like a, a surreal feeling, like. Like something, not not closure per se, but a way of something that needed to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was quite beautiful, you know, just kind of, you know, seeing everybody come together. Um, I really appreciate the fact that Kevin Barely, Tony Stopo, as well as the rest of the group kind of took the time to kind of come together, have that moment of silence, really just kind of just bring that unity and whatnot. And I really really appreciate it you know y'all having the the spartan strong t-shirts you know just kind of just seeing that as well as the pens um that was a really good moment you know for real and you know once again congratulations um for winning the michigan dodge World Cup. i know how much that means to the michigan region <laughs> absolutely sir absolutely uh, with that being said we can go ahead and kind of just go on to the next topic uh, which is the Ohio Dodgeball Cup um, 
week. We definitely had some surprises. Uh, for starters, Terrence, y'all jerseys were on fleek mode, my guy. Yeah, big thanks to Caleb for designing those. Uh, yeah, we like them a lot. Yeah, and um, your guy, Nate, came through with that fire promo video as well. Yes, he did. Although we caught some flack from OSU <laughs> afterwards. Sorry, right. mm-hmm. it was deserved. Ooh, we'll, we'll get into that momentarily. We'll get into that momentarily. So, uh, real fast, the placement for uh, the Ohio Diceboro Club, Cincinnati number one, um, Ohio State number two, Akron number three, Ohio number four, Bowling Green State University number five, Miami of Ohio, not Miami, Florida. Sorry, Canes. Number six, uh, Kent State, uh, number seven, and Cleveland State uh, came in at number eight. So, takeaways, surprises, upsets, anybody, the floor is yours. And the biggest surprise was Ohio. Uh, I, Terrence probably doesn't like talking about that. He probably wants to forget about what happened. But, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people, it was fairly even split between who's going to win the Ohio Dodgeball Cup between UC and Ohio. I think most people thought that. But it, Ohio finishing fourth was a big surprise. I mean, Ohio State, great performance. Uh, UC, UC was able to handle them pretty well. But Ohio State, a great performance against uh, – Ohio and really, and then the, the well, we'll get to war later, but uh, yeah, it was, it was really a coming out party for Ohio as a uh, Ohio State as a potentially final four contender, I think. Yeah, yeah, we were uh, really well on the home court. I think Cincinnati just that day they were just clearly the best team there, and it was kind of made aware when they beat Akron seven nothing in the semifinals. I remember at halftime, our game, uh, West came over to. Wes was watching our game like five minutes left in the first half, and they were sitting at halftime, and then I heard they had a running clock already, like at halftime. So I just knew like Cincinnati was going to come out strong in our game if they were playing that well. Um, I think Ohio, the, the loss to Akron, I think really shocked me, but I think that was just after a really a really emotional game. I mean, we beat them 4-3, and it was a fast game, a lot of throws and everything. So I think they just looked tired to me. I ref the, the Ohio-Akron game, and Ohio just did not look like the same team that – we just played. It looked like a completely different roster. They kind of looked tired, looked frustrated, which is understandable after a tough loss like that. So I don't think they're worse than Akron. I don't think they're the fourth best team in the region. I just think they had a tough performance after a really emotional game. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I'll talk about some of the other teams, though. Um, I We played our first game against Miami, and compared to playing them early in the year last year, the insane amount of development from their players um, is very evident, and they're getting a lot better every single tournament. I talked to a lot of people who were impressed with them, so that's a team to look out for. Um, Bowling Green kind of had a rough day. They lost uh, opening game to Akron. That was one that I know that they wanted to kind of surprise some people with. Um, but I know that they'll be back. They've got some really talented players. Uh, Kent State actually looked pretty good against Cincinnati. I was watching that game. They have a couple standout rookies, and I think that they um, they did well in the consolation bracket as well. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Yeah, Akron looked great other than against UC. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, I would definitely agree with the Kent and Miami parts. Um, both there, the captains from each team, respectively, uh, Elliot, Miami, and Vanessa at Kent, are doing great work in recruiting. Each team has some athletes. They're, they, they're still very young, so the strategy might not be as sound as they would want, but they have some kids that, if first point, they'll shock you. They'll just, they have some kids that can throw. So in next year, if two years from now, don't be shocked if they're in the running for ODC champions and stuff like that, because there's some serious young talent on those teams. Yeah, I yeah, agree. Especially Miami. I got to see them. I didn't get see them that much besides like, the stream against Ohio State at uh, at ODC. But especially at War, I saw they had there's some of their young players. And I we I personally played them at Nationals last year. And that is just a drastically different team. One guy that stood out was uh, Cole Ginocchio, I think his name is. Not, probably butchering that name, but he's number 10. He was – 
very like very good just catching everything he's a strong throw i'd say mid upper 60s probably i mean he's i think he's gonna be a future all-american player and he, i believe he's just a sophomore and miami has a couple of people like that who in the year or two could be contending for all ohio which as ryan was saying they could be an ohio dodgeball cup contender with a lot of the other teams in ohio like ohio state ou and uh, cincinnati having pretty veteran team. So as those guys age out, Miami could be up next. I could definitely attest to number 10 throw power with an X-ray if we, if you need proof of that. <laughs> oh, that's how you got injured. Yeah, so I could definitely attest to his uh, throw power. That kid has a throw, and he has a, he's a good sense for the game already, too. He was a good player. Yeah, I will say the one thing that I noticed about Miami in our game was that they were playing together the entire time. Um, they might not have any guys who are like clearly one of the best players in the league yet. They don't nothing like insanely talented, but they Ellie has them playing really well together. They push teams back. They push them back into their own shot clock. They play smart dodgeball. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely. I was definitely watching um, a portion of my industry stream when um, y'all was y'all was playing against them, and um, I want to say Caleb Arnold as well as Alex wasn't playing that game that first that first half. They definitely have that cohesion together as a team, and you can definitely tell like they there was really was playing for each other. They really didn't have anything to lose at all. So, you know, it was it was definitely fun to watch. I I know. Ryan had a little bit of fun because we normally do brackets, you know, towards nationals. But he was like, hey, like, let's do brackets, y'all. You know, let's do brackets. And uh, obviously, my bracket got busted. You know, I'm hoping that will not be the case for March Madness for the NCAA tournament. But uh, I'm going to blame you, Ryan, for destroying my bracket. I'm going to blame you, sir, because I, I had Ohio and Cincinnati playing in the finals but good job for yeah, you know, our team yeah our you, team definitely heard the noise that everyone was picking ohio and we knew that we played them tw uh twice tough before and it was my first time getting to play ohio with to be being able to throw all year so i it was a matchup person i was really looking forward to too knowing that we could definitely take them on and i think the match lived up to everyone's expectations even no matter which side you picked I might be a little biased by saying this, but I can, in my humble opinion, I definitely think that was a top 10 game this season without question. You easily. Can, you can yeah, easily. Yeah, you can I probably. Think top five, probably. Yeah, you can make a strong argument for top five just based off the back and forth and, you know, how much it meant for both teams and everything like that. And it, it was a great game, you know, from start to finish. Um, I know that emotions were high for both teams, so it's understandable, you know, especially in the heat of competition, for sure. Um, Ryan, you had a chance, you know, to kind of talk about MSU rookie, you know, putting in that good work. Alex, did you would you able to have a chance um, to kind of see um, Ohio State rookie um, at all um, during ODC by any chance? Yeah, I was actually watching him, and I got to say he's a uh... – one of the better right corners that I've seen this year. Um, he's like, even as a rookie, he seems to have a real sense for the game, which um, I think is the hardest part about being a rookie. Like he might be really good, like talently, but like being able to understand, Hey, when to throw, when to make a dumb throw, when they get back, like all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that was the hardest part for my rookie year. And he looks like he's doing it very well. He's a, obviously got a very good throw. Um, throw so much respect to him. Yeah, it was kind of just like happenstance that we threw him in the right corner because at the beginning of the year, we were planning on having Ethan left corner and I was going to play right corner. But then in our first tournament, I broke my thumb and couldn't throw. So we had Nick in the left corner with Ethan originally. And then when I couldn't play, we needed someone to go to right corner. And then I was like, Nick, you want to want to play right corner? And he took it and he never, he, we just kept him there. Even when I came back, I was like, I'll just play middle. Like there's no point in moving. Nick and now Alden, the other rookie, play together. They have chemistry from day one, and we just let them there and let them. Obviously, we, we do drills and stuff in practice to help them, but they both had dodgeball sense from day one, and their chemistry is top tier for only playing a few months. Don't you guys have another one, another rookie? Is it Aiden? 
Alden. Alden. Yeah, he Alden. plays right next to Nick. Yeah. He I, I was looking at some of his throws as well and they look pretty good. I'm impressed with him as well. Yeah, they both throw gas and they could both catch too. If they get caught without a ball, they're just not targets either. They can both ca- hold their own catching wise. Wait, so you said you were going to play right side? Yeah, and then I got hurt, so we, we put Nick saying. in the right. Hmm. And now yeah, I'm in the middle. Lefty right corner there ever was there. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Very, very interesting. You know, I won't be surprised um, day one, but for early day two, because I'm just selfish like that. But day one, you know, we might have a little 10 on, you know, a little MSU, Ohio State matchup, Big Ten matchup. I'm just saying. I don't I don't I don't make the bracket and I, I don't do the format. That's just me just being a fan, uh, just being selfish. But uh I always enjoy playing Ohio State. They're a, a fun team to play against. You know, they're, they're good. They've got talent. So you actually have to be on your A game to play them. It's, it's always a fun one. Yeah, both of our games last year were pretty electric, even though Michigan State got them both. But I think we're ready this year to take them on again. Ah, uh, that's the energy I was looking for. That was the energy I, I was looking for. One, one thing that I do have to take away from ODC, though, is that I feel like those top three teams that we mentioned, Ohio, Ohio State, and Cincinnati, when if they play a full game well like they can, they are, they're a team that can almost beat any team. A lot of times, though, like Cincinnati especially, they'll have a good half, and then they'll struggle in the second half. Or Ohio will do the same thing. Ohio State can do the same thing. Like If they play a full game up to what they know they can play, they're a really difficult team. Absolutely. Oh yeah, that's that's more than fair. And um, you know, speaking of takes, <laughs> the war, war six, that that has some interesting takes. Alrighty, no. okay, like there's there's some elephants in the room that will be addressed. Um, Cause gentlemen, each of y'all have the scores for that. Um, just, I'm just going to just pause for just a little bit, just kind of just let the atmosphere sit for a little bit, because we we definitely have some strong opinions. And I'm a moderator, so my opinion doesn't matter, so I'm not really going to be speaking. But, um, yeah, strong opinions. I haven't heard from you in a while, Daniel. Oh, yeah, there's no damn. <laughs> oh here we go. And I'm going to mute. I don't like talking about what happened. <laughs> Let's just say when we were down, when we had we were down three two to CSU. That it was a uh, that's probably the low point I've ever had in my dodgeball career for Maryland like coaching. I just had no words. I was like, I didn't even know. What, luck, luckily, we got a point in two minutes and went to overtime and won. But that was brutal. And then Miami, that was, that was immediately following when we played Miami, and I lost my minor down 2 0 at halftime, but we ended up pulling that one out as well. Thankfully, our players did not listen to me when I told them to step out, and then they caught out number 10 from Miami. So thankfully, they didn't listen to me. I, I, I'll, take the, I'll take being wrong on that one, but I think the biggest story from Moore, I'm not just going to talk about Maryland, is that UNL is. Uh, that everyone, I think everyone thought of them a potential Final Four team, but they proved that they got a lot of work to do before they get to that point. Now, to be fair to Nebraska, they travel further than any team oh, in the yeah. league. Oh, yeah. They was also dealing with that winter snowstorm that was taking place around Chicago and Indiana, which roughly two-thirds of their team was driving the other half. They flew. I didn't have money like that when I was in college, but that's another story for another day. And based off of their words, not my words, they wasn't at full strength. Now, I preference that because full strength means you can carry 18 out of the tournament. They had 16. Y'all can do what you wish with that information. 
Yeah, we played a uh, UNL at the last game, uh, last game of the day, and we were able to handle them easily. It was pretty evident early on that they've never dealt with the wall ball like that before. Like I was just sitting in the middle, just slamming against the wall until we had eight balls, and it just worked for the first two points. And then after that, they kind of seemed to get in their head, and they just kept throwing. Like we had eight balls against them, like ninety percent of the match. Like I've never had a match with that much ball control. So the, the talent's definitely there. Like uh, Colby Chorak, he has a strong arm. Uh, Caleb Fowler and Noel Wiley were two others I was impressed with. And their whole team's full of athletes. So if they can work on the wall ball and get some ball control, I think they could definitely make some noise and be underestimated going to nationals again and have some upsets on their mind. But they definitely just need to work on stopping wall ball and uh, getting ball control. Yeah, and the reason why that's important because – Feel free, you know, to correct me if I'm wrong, Terrence, but um, Nationals taking place at Ohio University, and wall ball is a factor. Is that correct, sir? Big time, yeah. Yeah, um, I'd say six out of the seven courts that we're going to play on are really bad. One of them has like a little more space than the others, but it, it's definitely a big factor. Alrighty, you, you you heard that everybody. Wall ball will be a factor. So if you're not used to it now, you got some time to get used to it because that will be a that will be a factor coming into nationals. Um, speaking of which, Ryan, you got your revenge against Cincinnati by beating them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we definitely it was definitely a game we really wanted, especially after the week before letting them win ODC on our home court. In a one-point loss, we definitely focused a lot of the week on what we did wrong in Cincinnati and what to improve on. And the biggest thing was just getting off our back line. When we were stuck on our back line at ODC, they kind of just held us there and wall-balled us to death. And then once they got ball control, you're not going to be able to beat Cincinnati if they have seven or eight balls. So that's kind of what did us in. But in the match at war, we were kind of able to get off our back line, encounter some, get bred out encounters. And that's really what led us to – to victory. I know we moved uh, Derek Kemper, one of the best blockers in the league, to the left corner to try to just be there in front of Brett. And really, if Brett threw, we kind of just all went after Brett just to get him off the court because of the impact he had at ODC. And that was really our game plan, and it really worked. It, we almost – we could have won by more than one if we didn't – we almost had a point at the end. We kind of blew a point going into half, and we're still able to win. So there's still stuff to definitely improve on in that game, but that was definitely – that game and our game against UNL were – the two best games we played all year by far. Oh yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, I would definitely say, as I was like watching some of the other streams, um, I remember when we were discussing about the Ohio Dodgeball Cup, um, that Kent, you know, was definitely improving quite a bit. I don't know what happened um, at war, but whatever it is that they did, like they turned the switch on, like their catching ability was just crazy. And mind you, Akron and Kent is only about 15 minutes away from each other, and they only brought eight. But boy, they were, whatever time it was on Demon's time when it came to catching, they was catching nearly everything in sight. Yeah, I think if Ken can get their numbers up, they can definitely be the team a team that makes the round of 16 at Nationals. I mean, that's been their biggest issue, not only in experience, but having eight people, it's really impossible to beat any team that's not towards the bottom of the league. So, I mean, I think if they can bring 12 to Nationals and a solid 12, I think that they could maybe even get make a, make a top five team work a little bit harder for that round of 16 win. And I think that'd be a great step for the program as they last year, they were effectively non-existent. So, I mean, I, I know they practiced, but they didn't have enough people to even attend a tournament really. So I think this is, this is a great step for them, but uh, yeah, I mean, their only loss was to UWP, which is a much more experienced team team has a lot of veterans well coached. I mean, yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's definitely a great step for Ken, but. Yeah, I, I rep the two of Kent's games, and their catching ability is definitely better than some even middle-of-the-road teams in the league. Like, they were able to catch pretty much anyone if they hit him in the chest. And they have some athletes, too. I know we were talking about it before at ODC, but they have some throwers that they're developing, and 
like Dan said, if they could bring 12 to Nationals, they're definitely not in that bottom tier anymore. They're kind of approaching that middle tier. So we'll see how many they bring to Nationals. And I know some of them do practice with Akron because of the close drive. So it really helps them get experience with a better team in the league, which can only help them in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And again, the team that you just talking about, Akron, I don't know what it is, man, but when they play at home, that's a really tough team to beat. They schedule four games, and they won all four games. They met Pink Out, too. They also Three went up. Yep, they also went undefeated at Pink Out, too. And um, looking at the standings, they're currently ranked number four, and I can definitely tell you uh, that. I, it's, I think they they know how to play their gym very well. It, it, it's a, it is a, it is a wall ball gym, but certain spots you, you can hit and it won't wall ball. We are on a problem. I know, especially against Miami and CSU, we were throwing, and if you throw it low at certain points, it will hit the bottom of the bench and stick, and you won't get the ball back. So we are having problems with that. But when we played Akron, literally every, every throw we were on their back line was wall balled back. It was it was very frustrating. But I mean, they you got you, you got to play the court. And then they knew how to play the court, especially the court one where it has the weird corner in the one end. They, they knew how to wall ball off that too. I mean, we had, we were a little undermanned, so we couldn't really push, push them out as much. And it, it was kind of frustrating, but I mean, we'll see if they can play at a court, how if they can play at OU at nationals and how that changes. You know, Daniel, you, you really kind of brought up a good point because our next subject is literally in regarding to nationals, as in national contenders. And um, man, what a great segue because um, Caleb Arnold did a great job giving us the new um, college dodgeball standing um, graphics. And, you know, right now we still have Cincinnati number one. We have the Ohio State at number two because they climb through the rankings. We have Michigan State number three. Still undefeated, though. Just got to preface that out. They're the only undefeated team, undefeated team left. Akron up to number four. I believe that's their highest ranking ever in their program history. James Madison's at number five. Um, Grand Valley at number six. Penn State number seven. Ohio University number eight. Nebraska's at number nine. They didn't move. They didn't go up. They didn't go down. They just kind of say the same. Bowling Green at number 10. University of Maryland at 11. Um, Wisconsin Platinum at 12. Saginaw Valley State at 13. Western Michigan at 14. Miami University at 15. Um, excuse me. Um, Central Michigan at number 16. Virginia, University of Virginia at 17. Kent State at number 18. Cleveland State at number 19, and um, the other school from Wisconsin at number 20. My apologies, could not get your name correctly. I'm not trying to disrespect the Burks. Yeah. Thank you. It's yeah. That's on me, y'all. I'm not trying to disrespect the Birds. Love y'all uniforms. All righty. So most likely, I want to say it's probably going to be about maybe 20, maybe 22 teams coming to Nationals. And um, we we got we got some very interesting storylines, gentlemen. We got some very interesting storylines. Um, Akron coming in at number four. That's you you know a lot of teams are going to be asking for them to play. Same thing for Ohio State. Same thing for Michigan State. Same thing for Ohio. And yes, even Maryland because Daniel some teams in the league. They don't believe that the Dirty Terps are legit. So, again, Amen. Ge- gentlemen, you can you can take it they, away. They saw the team at war. It'll be different next time. Very different. But uh, I think I think the Final Four could be very interesting this year. He's going into uh, these last couple of tournaments. I was pretty much locked in the mindset that it was uh, it would be UC GV. MSU and JMU. I was locked in on that. But uh, seeing how Ohio State played and seeing how Penn State's been playing recently, 
I think that those teams could definitely make runs to the Final Four and maybe even beyond that because when they're on their game, they can beat anyone on the, in the country. And Ohio had a rough showing, but I know the, the other team that's been up been in that conversation the whole year, and I think they could definitely get back there. UNL was a team that's a lot may thought of that, but as we t- spoke about a couple minutes ago, it's, they've kind of fallen off into the next tier, and they've even fallen out of the top eight. So it's hard to tell that where they stand or if they'll even be a quarterfinal team this year again. So, I think for me, like out of the Ohio teams, I think it's just it's just who plays better that day. Like, and that's yeah. just dodgeball in a nutshell. Like, whoever plays better is gonna win. So, between Ohio State, Ohio, and Cincinnati, just who plays better that day will make the final four, in my opinion. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on matchups too. Who do you who do you get day one? How many how many arms you have to use day one? And who do you get day two is your first round matchup, a team you have to try for? Or can you do you get a high enough seed where you can get a team where you really don't have to play at all and you can kind of coast the game, and then go into that round of eight game with a fresh arms and it just saves you a game? Because I know last year we played Saginaw in the first round as they were an eleven seed and they tired our arms out more than they probably should have because we were just trying to coast the game. We thought we were a lot better than them. They came out strong. We had a really put a lot of our arms into just beating them. And then we went to the Michigan State game, and you could just tell they came in fresh, and we were already a little tired, and they just out-armed us and just played better than we did, partially because they, because they were a little fresher. And even day one, we had, we had two really close games day one, and I think that really killed us. So I think the biggest takeaway is being able to dominate day one and early in day two to limit, your arm, to limit the amount you use your arms is the biggest factor into making the Final Four and beyond. One one big thing I saw that was like GV's what we said it was a six seed, right? That's like a difficult non final four matchup for any team that you're gonna play. Like that's to have to play them and then a final four matchup and then some like that can be really difficult for a like a higher seed. Yeah, there's definitely gonna be some matchups in the quarterfinal, whether it be a team like Ohio, Ohio State playing a GV or JMU that those teams will have to work, and I don't think they'll be nearly as fresh in the final. So it will definitely be interesting to see how it plays out. And even Michigan State is undefeated. They're not immune to getting that at this point. They, with how the rankings shape out right now, they could draw, um, like I said, OU or Ohio State in the quarterfinal, and that could make them work. And then when they play a team, say, for example, if Cincinnati played uh, – Bowling Green or someone in the quarterfinal, they they wouldn't have to work nearly as hard, and they'll be a lot more fresh coming into that. So I think that's definitely a storyline to watch. But going in, and how it's interesting to see how the bracket shapes out. Obviously, we won't have a national schedule, but depending on who requests who, for a team like Akron, I think or Penn State could gather gather a lot of requests this year. Because- it's it's going to be interesting because we still got a few weeks left in the season. We might have a few more tournaments. I know there's some teams that are planning or going to um, University of Kentucky, you know, try to get some matchups in there. Um, there may be another East Coast tournament, either at Penn State or at University of Virginia. We're not really 100% for sure yet. And I know there's some teams, they're on spring break right now, and they're just like, hey, like let's just, let's just kind of just practice. Let's just kind of just rest our arms. Let's kind of just get ready for nationals. Um, but there's definitely like like some really great storylines, um, and also for everyone who's watching, nationals is double. What I mean by that is like the points are double, um, so swings can go drastically for teams, um, especially if you're considered an underdog and you make an upset. You know you can you can jump really fast um, in in terms of ranking. And um, for the most part, at Nationals, um, they played three games on day one. Um, and then depending upon where you're seated, you know, if you're one of those top teams, you can kind of get a little bit of a break and don't have to play in that playing game. Um, I want to say you have to play seven games in total to get to the championship. I, Okay, yep. Okay, good, good, good. So... Yeah. Long story short, there's going to be a lot of Thai arms. There's going to be a ton of ibuprofen. There's going to be a ton of Gatorade. Um, 
people are going to be sore, but it's it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great time because nationals is the time period for a lot of people to show who they are, what they're capable of, which comes to our last topic, the All-American contenders. We And we definitely got some strong opinions and feelings about this one as well, because each of y'all have individuals that you would deem worthy, not just as an All-American, but as a potential first-team All-American. And I'll just leave it at that. I'll let's start off, and uh, I think in the last two weeks, Brett Liming for MVP is a serious, a serious uh, conversation we can have. I, I think everyone was kind of get throwing to Jack Gerling there as best player, best team kind of thing. But uh, I think Brett, especially how he played at ODC, and if you watch him play in Nebraska, I watched, I ref that game, and he was, he was on something. He was impossible to get out. I mean, and that's just. He's just been a different beast recently, so uh, I think him for MVP. I mean, he's a lot for first team All American. Anyone who says differently is horribly misinformed. But uh, I think the MVP is a serious consideration. Yeah, and I think he was kind of forgotten about last year. Behind like yeah. Corey had an electric season, and Ski made second team as a, a pretty electric middle player. But in the the season where COVID shut it down, I think Brett was an All Ohio player. And I think last year he happened to miss the, even the All-Ohio all list. He kind of just got forgotten about because I think people just knew what Brett was. And I think people just kind of forgot how good he was because they already knew what he was. But this year at ODC, he really showed out and reminded people how good he really is. And um, I think, yeah, he's definitely top five All-American is definitely somewhere he can land, depending on how UC does at Nationals. Yeah, I think it's – it's hard to see, like, because the season's not over yet. We still have Nationals, which is the biggest tournament of the year. But I think there's three guys from MSU. I think it's Jack Gerling, Barry Butler, Josh Kramer. And I think that they are three of the most impact, impactful players in the league. Like, Josh with his catching, he can swing a point. Barry and Jack can wipe out a whole team. Like, all three guys, like, really good players. Um, but a guy not from MSU, um, PJ from Akron. I feel like he's he slept on a little bit, and um, from what I've seen, he's really good player, deserving of first yeah, team or thing about PJ is he really controls the whole Akron offense. He really, I mean, they have some other guys, Matt Young, Clay Eggleston, Eric Cavanaugh, some other good players, but good throwers. But PJ, when PJ's in, just how he plays in the middle, really makes the other team direct their focus to him, which opens up the corners a lot more and their secondary throwers. And if he gets out, they don't have that presence. And I think that really hurts them when he's in Akron could potentially could really beat anyone. As we've seen, they beat teams like JMU, some of the top teams in the league, they beat Ohio. I mean, I, so, but I mean, obviously, like, as we said, we'll see how they do away from home, but when PJ's in PJ needs to be in for them, for those, for them to compete in those games and how he controls the middle is really like there's, Count on one hand how many players that can do that in the league. Yeah, no, PJ is definitely a really good player. If there was one thing I, I think he would have to work on for Akron to improve in Nationals would be just staying in because of the impact he has. Sometimes he tries, like, he'll have two balls and throw them both. And even if he gets two kills and then gets himself out, it's kind of, like, not worth it given how much impact he has. So if at Nationals he can keep himself in and those against good teams, he could definitely make a run in All-American list. But – if he's if he's out a lot of the time at nationals, I think Akron's going to really struggle. So it really depends on how he how he protects himself. And if he does, he's definitely one of the one of the better players in the Ohio region for sure. Yeah, I remember in our most recent game with them, whenever he was in towards the end in the end game, they uh, kind of wiped the floor with us. But it just wasn't every time. So it, I agree with Ryan. It's a matter of how long he can stay in. And, yeah, I think if he is, then Akron can hang in, hang in with anyone. He's a really good player. That he is. That he is. But, Terrence, don't you all have some really solid players as well? I mean, I know Caleb Arnold was a first-team All-American last year. I know we got, you know, my man Alex as well, the, you know, the savvy veteran. He can make a deep run. I think he was like an All-American back when he was with GV. 
and also yourself too, man. Like I know you're a sophomore, but I I saw how you responded to JMU crowd, and you know mm-hmm. they was they was trying to give you a hard time, and you told them to be quiet and wave goodbye when you hit my man. Like yeah, that's that's a top ten play. Like y- y'all got y'all got some contenders out there that could make a deep run for a first team All American, you know. And, pl- yeah, and plus, are, and, and plus, y'all better. playing at home too. Yeah, true. Uh, home court is definitely going to be an advantage for us. Um, but yeah, our veterans definitely definitely lead us. Uh, Caleb and Alex, everybody knows those names. Um, they both made the lists last year. I wouldn't be surprised if they did again. They've both been great players for us. Uh, I'd also like to shout out our other captain, Max Steckel. Um, he's been on the team for a while. He kind of helped bridge the gap uh, when COVID happened. We didn't really have many returners. Um, and before Alex and Caleb even showed up, he was already helping rookies. And he's a really underrated player. Uh, he's got a rocket for an arm, and he's an underrated catcher. So I would love to see him on at least an all-Ohio team. I think that would be very well-deserved. I'm, in, I'm interested to hear your, y'all's thoughts on – so outside the top eight or nine – who are some players y'all like for whether it be first or second team All-American? Because uh, everyone talks about the top players on the top teams, but the lower teams don't get the most coverage. So I'm not only just trying to push my agenda, you know, but I'm trying to hear what y- y'all's thoughts on that. Um, one player who I know does not get the recognition he deserves is Caleb Newell from UWP. Um, Numerous times this season, last season, he carries their team offensively. He's not too shabby of a catcher either. Um, And I just don't know. I know that not too many people know about him, or at least not enough. Um, I would completely agree with him being on an All-American team. Um, Definitely top three on the Central Region team. Yeah. Yeah, when we played UWP, it was like once you got him out, their team just fell apart, so... I was kind of our focus. If he threw, we had two balls on him, and that was just our whole game plan, and it worked. We were able to win that game single handedly just by making sure Caleb wasn't able to wasn't able to just win points with his with his arm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, we have evidence firsthand. He missed the Grand Valley Gauntlet tournament, and they got against GV and Michigan State, who are top teams in the league. But UWP with him, those games can be. 4-2, 5-2, but without him, I think it was 8 or 9-0 they lost, and they just look completely disorganized offensively. And I think he provides an element that uh, of leadership and presence that not, not many players in the league have, which he's needed on the court at all times, similar to P.J. from Akron, as we talked about. And I think it, uh, Michigan State and UWP played at the uh, Peter Bro tournament, and I believe UWP took two points on him. So it, that, that, it was definitely a different game when Caleb was playing versus not playing at Grand Valley. Yeah, he's definitely an impactful player. Um, I was lined up right across from him the whole game, and it's you can't make a the wrong throw or a untimely throw or else you're going to get run down and it might be an out for you. So he's definitely a really good player. Um, definitely a lot of respect to him. Uh, another couple of guys that don't get the respect they deserve is Joe Barber and Cole Michela. Um they're both not on a not on a super team, but they both kind of like uh, glue that team together. Like if you get Joe and Cole out, that team kind of falls apart. But they're kind of that glue piece to that team. So I think they're both deserving of at least getting uh, all uh, all Michigan votes. Um, a couple guys on JMU that don't normally get the credit. Uh, I would say mostly because Evan is one of the best players in the league and he's really identifiable. But um, we've played them twice this year. And uh, JT is an incredible left corner. He's a really good crosser, um, really good catcher. Their rookie, Foss, um, I think he's right there with Fidoa for best hands from a rookie. He's incredible. Um, Trent Schaefer is a really good player. Um yeah, I don't know about the rookie, but those two guys, I could definitely see getting all American votes. Trent yeah. and JT, they're both really good. Yeah, I haven't uh, watched Jamie much in person, but from what I've seen on film from watching Beast, it's 
when JMU's playing well, which they did at their home tournament, they have two or three guys that are definitely all American contenders with they always just have a ton of arms and even this year from what I've noticed is they're catching way more than I remember in the past. I remember last year it kind of just seemed like they just they were they were gonna get you out with their arm or you were just gonna stay alive. But this year they can catch you. I know some of that's due to the rookie and Foss, but JT's a, some guys someone I see always making catches. And even guys like Spear and Schaefer, even though the throwers, they'll put their body behind the ball and catch one. So Yeah, Spear's yeah, they, a really good catcher too. Yeah, they have a few guys that can definitely contend for an all American list. And another guy from the East Coast is uh Hunter I forget the guy from Penn State. I forgot his last name. Hunter Stewart. Yeah, Hunter Stewart, yeah. He I watched like the last like ten minutes of a uh, UC Penn State, and he was definitely the guy in the corner that uh, was definitely the best player on their team and someone you had to focus on against Penn State. I remember UC telling me that because they, they they obviously played him that he was the best player on their team and someone to look out for. Yeah, I feel like with a team like Penn State, it's kind of hard because it seems like every game a different player goes off for their team. Um, they're pretty well balanced, and you could even say they're more of a catching team, which makes it even harder to identify someone who kind of stands out. But I know Hunter's a really good player. Um, I know Cloud has really good games. Um, I think uh, Blanchard, correct me if I'm wrong. Mason, Daniel, yeah, Mason. He's, yeah, he's really good. Um, yeah, Zach Eck teams. is someone who's – Zach Eck, uh, cousin of Brady Eck, who was on uh, Penn State last year. But uh, Zach Eck, he's, still, he's, a, he's their left corner. He's, he's the lefty. He's a strong throw, but he also will make some of the craziest hand catches you'll ever see. He's a very streaky player, but I think he could find himself on All-American team if he gets on a hot streak at Nationals. Like he was at Beast, he was on another level, and that, that helped Penn State really just beat JMU that day and go 3-0 and in that tournament. And he's a guy that when he's on, he's on. So if, if he does that at Nationals, I think he'll definitely get some All-American votes. Yeah, I think for Penn State, it depends on how good they play and who's really going off for them on day two of Nationals. If they're an Elite Eight team, they might – struggle to have someone make first team because there's the final four teams other teams run the league. But if they make a final four run, they'll definitely have names contending for that first team because they'll just have more eyes on them. So we'll, it'll, I think it'll depend on how they do at Nationals for a lot of them and who, do, who, who gets on a hot streak. Yeah, and, um, you know, speaking of hot streaks and whatnot, um, you know, we're in March Madness, so upset are definitely a factor. Is, is there anyone who think that, um, you know, certain teams could potentially be upset and not make it, you know, to the Elite Eight or the Final Four based off of the bracket? I mean, I'll say I don't think Akron is a Final Four team. Um, I know they're ranked fourth right now. Um, I, I would say that would be my hot take. I think if there was a team that, um, would disappoint on a day two nationals, even though I'm good friends with a lot of them. I think it'd be Cincinnati because we've seen times where they look unbeatable, like at ODC, where they're just playing their game. Then they have times with like at a war where it looked like they really struggled for a lot of like they struggled against us for a lot of the game, and they even struggled with Penn State for like a whole half. They really just couldn't get anything going, they looked dead. So by day two of nationals, they're kind of tired or they don't come out feeling right. I think they could definitely be a team that struggles and maybe lose to a team like Penn State or Ohio or I don't think I don't think Akron if Akron's playing their A game, I don't think that's something that's impossible, even though I think it's highly unlikely. But I think if Cincinnati's playing well, they have they could title hopes, but if not, I think they could definitely be an early exit. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I know that a while back not everybody but some people do believe that GV, based off of standings and bracket play, may not make it to the Final Four. Not my personal opinion. I'm just, just saying it's based off of the standings because let's just say hypothetically, season, season in today, Michigan stay at number three, Grand Valley's at number six. Both teams go to the lead eight. Michigan State haven't lost to Grand Valley. Conventional wisdom says... Michigan State should move on. Again, not my personal opinion, but. I think we're really just, uh, Grand Valley, I don't think they've ever missed a Final Four since the club was founded. 
I believe that's a that's a thing. But uh, I think just across the NCAA this year, we're seeing a level of parity that we've never really had, especially especially I'd say with the top eight teams. Realistically, the top eight or nine teams could all make the Final Four run, which I don't think is really something that we've had, at least in my time in the NCAA. And I know before that, it was even worse because we'd see a team like Grand Valley go – what is it, like 28-1 or whatever, and really just win nearly every game the whole season. And I don't think we really see – I mean, Michigan State's undefeated, but we haven't seen them rematch a team like Cincinnati, Ohio State. They haven't played GMU yet. They haven't played Penn State yet. So they haven't played a lot of the – besides GV, they haven't really played a lot of the top teams recently. So I think we could definitely see some interesting action, especially in the quarterfinal. And maybe even the round 16, we could see a team like uh, from – Maryland, UWP, Saginaw, beat a uh, Penn State or Akron or Ohio and make that quarterfinal, which could be interesting. Interesting thing to watch. Yeah, back on the GV Final Four thing, I think the the biggest thing for Nationals, as we talked about before, is having just enough arms to get through the day. And I think if you're going to look at Grand Valley and think about one thing that maybe has been the reason they're not as dominant as they have been, is that arm depth. You have Ben Smart, you have Budai, you have Israels, now you have Josh Hill, but after that, there's not really anyone I think most teams would be afraid of throwing-wise. It's a lot of young rookies who's – they could reset throw, but I don't think they're going to be able to carry points like those top four guys. So I think it will depend a lot on if those rookies can be counted on in a Nationals match against a team like Saginaw if they get matched up or a team like Akron. Can the top arms rest and be ready for day two? Or is Ben Smart, Josh going to have to throw day one just to even get him there and then be tired by day two? So I think we'll – I think – Day one will tell us a lot about how GV will look day two. Yeah, and I think the, the seedings are going to change a decent bit before in like the day two of Nationals, right? I don't think Akron's going to be that, that four spot. I don't think – I think maybe someone like GV will slide into that four spot, and then they'll, they will make the final four probably. Like it's, it's hard to say now, but I think GV is probably a final four team. I think it also depends. We haven't seen JMU away from – their home tournament in front of a crowd since last semester. So I've been interested to see if, uh, if JMU plays another tournament before nationals, how they look without the momentum of their crowd in everyone's ear. Cause I think we saw with Ohio, it's, it definitely makes a big factor as we saw at their home tournaments. I'd love to see what they look like. And if Eschenberg, if Eschenberg, how he looks and how the rest of their team looks arm and catching wise. Yeah, I think we get a lot of shakeups because it, teams like JMU or Penn State being on the East, unless you played them at one of the Akron tournaments, you really didn't get a chance to play them at all. And Akron is also a team that I think will gather a lot of requests. So those three, I think, will be heavily requested at Nationals, especially by the top 10 teams, because they'll want to try to boost their rankings so they'll get a stronger opponent. And Akron, the team saying like at four, if you're Ohio or Penn State looking at that, you're like, this is a, this is a great chance for us to move up and get into that top four coming into bracket play. So that'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see the request and how the schedule shakes out on day one to see what, what we'll get on day two. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so with that being said, we're getting really close up to the hour mark. And I did promise y'all gentlemen, like this will only be an hour at the most might go a little bit over time. Uh, but with that being said, like does anybody have any, last comments, you know, other hot takes they want to say. Daniel, I know you personally believe that your boy Adam should yeah. be a first team all American. I know you haven't had a chance to talk about him yet, but you have expressed that if he does well, Maryland has an opportunity to make some noise at nationals. I mean, yeah, the difference in our team, as you saw, overtime versus CSU to a team that nearly beat Penn State in December with Adam is a big difference. Uh, but I, I'm just going to let the play do the talking. He wasn't able to make war. He had prior commitments, but the schedule changed, so it didn't work out. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just let – see how day one shakes out. I think we put in some good requests, some teams that we could easily hop and get into that the 8 to 10 range coming into bracket play, which would put us in prime position to make the quarterfinals, which is our goal. And like I said, um, Ryan, Terrence, Alex, any um, 
Any last comments? Any hot takes? Get on the Nationals live stream and watch those games. They're going to be a lot of good ones. I agree. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be electric. Yeah, it's too many good teams in this league for there not to be just a bunch of electric matchups and standing shakeups before day two when you're going to get another day of incredible matchups. Agree. Agree. And most likely the Nationals, um, day one and day two, will most likely be on YouTube or the NCAA YouTube page as we are striving towards getting a thousand subscribers. So please, if you haven't subscribed to the NCAA YouTube page, please, please, please subscribe as we are reaching towards a goal of 1,000 subscribers. Gentlemen, it's been a privilege and an honor being your moderator tonight. I want to say thank you for taking time out of your evening for making this possible. And I also want to say thank you for making this cordial because uh, I know that Dodgeball yeah. players are very passionate about their teams and their players and the rankings. So I appreciate each and ever each of y'all for just being professional um, and having these conversations in a very cordial manner.